all think of the human system and the ecosystem as suppose say two entities which are constantly interacting with each other there are actions or interventions which can be classified as economic activities on the other hand the ecosystem or the natural ecosystem works in its own inevitable organic ways to provide us with certain goods and services free of cost and these goods and services that the ecosystem has been providing us are called the ecosystem services the millennium ecosystem assessment which uh, essentially was published in 2005 that classified this ecosystems that publication classified ecosystem services into four critical services namely the provisioning services of the ecosystem the regulating services of the ecosystem the uh, cultural services of the ecosystem and finally there is an umbrella service which supports these three uh, services of the ecosystem what we call the supporting services of the ecosystem so provisioning services are essentially the provisions that the ecosystem are making us available in terms of quantities like food fiber fishery fuel non timber forest products etc etc as far as the regulating services are concerned of course water regulation carbon sequestration uh, then um, uh, pollution control uh, uh, disease control all these are regulating services of the ecosystem as far as the cultural services are concerned we have uh, recreation tourism uh, religion these are the cultural services of the ecosystem but at the same time there is an umbrella service which is holding these three services that is essentially uh, the supporting service of the ecosystem like soil formation or primary production because without soil being formed the forest is not going to be there the delta ecosystem is not going to be there and eventually neither the provisioning nor the supporting nor the cultural services of the ecosystem are uh, are, are are going to be there for the human society now here comes the criticality that when we keep on intervening into the working of the ecosystem we extract more we exploit more in fact we keep on unsustainably consuming the ecosystem and as we keep on consuming or suppose a perturbation on the working of the ecosystem what we lose out in the process are the ecosystem services these ecosystem services because the ecosystem has its own structural functions you perturb that and eventually the structure and function they get perturbed uh, the processes get perturbed and what you lose out are critical ecosystem services at some point in time we thought of constructing the farakka barrage in fact uh, just to divert the water uh, uh, to resuscitate the kolkata port which was uh, getting into a moribund state the issue was that uh, this is going to increase the navigability of the kolkata port but the fact remains that in the process the dry season flow on the main stream of the ganges uh, declined substantially bangladesh in fact started complaining we got into an agreement 1996 uh, ganges water sharing agreement with bangladesh but at the same time what we didn't apprehend we didn't anticipate at that point was that the water or the river flow or suppose say the hydrological flow is not merely the flow of the liquid or the water itself the hydrological flow entails what uh, let me just reverberate which what uh, jayanto bandopadhyay articulated very recently that this is a balance of webs water energy biodiversity and sediment if you intend to extract energy or hydropower from the system sediment is going to drop if you want to divert the water through some other channel sediment is again going to drop so eventually what we have in the upstream of farakka is huge amount of sedimentation the sediment that used to flow with the liquid flow is simply not reaching the delta ecosystem and this is essentially a clear perturbation of the balance that the ecosystem essentially maintained now the as far as the delta is concerned the delta is not getting resuscitated precisely because the sediment is not flowing there this is affecting by the delta i essentially mean the ganga delta or the ganges delta out here of which the sundarbans delta happens to be a critical component the sundarbans archipelago which consists of 102 islands now on the one hand we have this force of uh, sea level rise the sea level has been rising alarmingly in fact a host of estimates are there uh, particularly on part of the indian sundarbans delta some uh, estimates state that it's between 4 mm 
uh, per year. And recently over the last decades, it's been increasing at the rate of between four and eight millimeters per year. One has to go through these estimates. But uh, so what is happening is because stream flow has declined during the dry season or during the lean season and the saline water uh, or, or the sea level is rising, the saline water, there is salinity in ration and the saline water is taking up the space of the fresh water. So what we have is disappearing islands in the archipelago on the one hand. And at the same time, the, the delta, the soil formation of the delta is, has been completely disturbed. So the resuscitation of the delta soil is simply not happening and the delta is shrinking. So this essentially is the lost, clear loss of the supporting services of the ecosystem uh, through hydrological intervention. Now here comes a very, very critical element that when we are talking about changes in hydrological flows, it has been happening um, across the years. In fact, uh, it's nothing new. In fact, the developed world thought about it between the 1920s and the 1960s. These were considered to be the dam building decades of the United States of America. Uh, and they went for the best of the projects. In fact, if you think about our Damodar Valley Corporation, that is essentially some kind of, uh, I shouldn't say a replication, but of course got largely influenced by the Tennessee Valley Corporation. The Central Arizona project came up, in fact, uh, in the United States of America. Uh, we have the Hoover Dam, we have the best of the engineering, uh, uh, engi uh, engineering structures out there just to govern or train the rivers. But from the 1980s and the 1990s onwards, both the United States of America and the European Union started realizing that this has been causing immense damage to their ecosystem and not only to the ecosystem, there is an inextricable linkage between the ecosystem and the livelihoods, human livelihoods. Just as we are losing out on fisheries, we are losing out on the Delta ecosystem and eventually we are losing out uh, on agriculture. So uh, because, because we are not getting the fresh water. A similar phenomenon in fact has been prevailing uh, in the lower Colorado as far as uh, Mexico is concerned. With the central Arizona project, large part of water diversion happened there. There is stream flow depletion, in fact, further downstream uh, in, the, in, in the lower Colorado Basin. And, uh, there's, uh, and, and on the other hand, there is salinity ingration. The soil was getting saline. And in the process, the Mexican rice cultivation to a large extent got spoiled. You will find that, in fact, in this part of the world, in South Asia, there is a very, very classical adaptation mechanism that has been happening. In Sundarbans, large parts of Sundarbans, you will find that the paddy fields are being converted to aquaculture. This is because uh, aquaculture, in fact, uh, is thriving well in the brackish water, the water becoming brackish and salinity invasion happening. That is some kind of an adaptation mechanism. But in the process, if you lose out on the land, neither aquaculture nor uh, agriculture, nothing is going to survive. So I've just talked about the Sundarbans Delta. So what we have to acknowledge in here is that there are two types of conflicts that are emerging. One at the spatial or a sectoral level. And it's this water conflict is not merely the classical water conflict of upstream downstream uh, waters. It's not the Kaveri uh, water conflict of Karnataka Tamil Nadu of quantity that somebody is taking away my water or a, a classical water conflict of, of uh, say uh, of, of the Jordan Yarmouk say uh, Israel, uh, Jordan, and Syria, but, or, or suppose the water conflicts of the Nile between Ethiopia and Egypt, but it's the water conflict between the human economic needs and the ecosystem needs, the ecosystem services needs, the ecosystem structural needs. Now in the process, it needs to be acknowledged that it is because of, there is a very, very critical linkage uh, of, the, of, of the ecosystem uh, with the human livelihoods, ultimately when the ecosystem gets hampered, the long-term human livelihoods gets hampered. So you might lose out on the fisheries in the, lo in, in, in the, in the long-term critical fisheries because uh, by, when you construct a barrage, which happened in fact uh, uh, with the Three Gorges Dam, that essentially completely impeded the movement of the several fish species. And eventually the fishermen community, uh, they were the ones who were the sufferers in the process. But at the same time, it needs to be, uh, to, to be remembered that it's not merely the 
the spatial or the sectoral dimension of human economic need and the ecosystem need. It's also, a, there's a temporal dimension. The ecosystem might not reflect its damage right from day one. It's over time that the damage essentially uh, gets magnified. So uh, in fact, the sedimentation or suppose say the soil formation capacity of the ecosystem as far as the delta is concerned didn't decline right from day one but over a space of uh, 20 years so there is a spatial dimension to this newer form of water conflict as well as a temporal dimension to this newer form of water conflict so a better way to articulate this conflict is essentially to talk about the conflict between the short-term economic demand of water and the long-term ecosystemic demand or sustainability concerns of the human society. And with this sustainability concerns, uh, uh, what are associated are the diverse ecosystem processes, which are sustaining the structures, the ecosystem structures, and eventually the ecosystem services, which uh, where essentially the, the interface or the uh, interaction of the human society and the ecosystems keep on happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is also a conflict over paradigms to govern water. Uh, are we going to look at water as a stock of resource to be used? Or we are going to have an ecological perception of water as a flow in the entire hydrological cycle. And addressing this conflict demands ecological knowledge for identification and articulation of related ecosystem functions and services on the one hand, and of course of the diverse economic demands on the other hand. So we, this is where essentially we are talking of a holistic and an integrated approach, taking the ecology or the ecosystem, the economy and the society in a common thread, in fact, in, 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 a, in, in an integrated framework. But what we have in India is, of course, a myopic approach, a fragmented approach as opposed to an integrated approach. At the very outset, it begins with, uh, as I give you the example of the Faratka Baraj, there are a number of examples which I will come across. Uh, the short term of the myopic economic benefits we call without thinking of the long term sustainability concerns. In fact, uh, we are still uh, carrying the legacy or rather still under the influence of the, of, of the British colonial hangover of uh, structuralist engineering. More so because we still have in our mind the Neo-Malthusian creed, which states that it is, we have to address scarcity in some way or the other. Whose scarcity? Scarcity of water for humans or scarcity of water for sustaining the human society as a whole. And when I'm talking of sustaining the human society as a whole, I'm simply talking, uh, here comes the conflict with the short run and the long run. Conservation, or suppose say, taking this integrated ecological and economic approach is essentially a selfish human need at this point in time, uh, when you are taking into consideration also the time dimension. The, British engineers or the European engineers who brought about this water engineering thinking, in fact, in India, they didn't understand the hydrographs or suppose say the, uh, uh, essentially the graphs which depicted the monthly flows of water at a particular, uh, at, 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 at a particular station, measuring station in a river. Uh, more so because they were more uh, accustomed to looking at horizontal hydrographs, which characterize the European rivers. But when they came to India, they found that it's something, especially when they were looking at the Himalayan river systems, uh, they were astounded. I mean, they have the, these hydrographs look like a normal distribution curve, a bell-shaped curve. It's in fact, something like a pretty low flows, particularly during the summer and the dry season. And suddenly it shots up during the Southwest monsoon. And then it comes down again. So is this an aberration? How do we manage this? And that is precisely why they started looking at, uh, at floods and routes as extreme events. 
but essentially as far as our traditional knowledge of uh, water governance is concerned we were always accustomed with this floods and droughts were always treated as part of the system rather they are they, they, they are integral components of the global hydrological cycle and this is where essentially this is the knowledge that we are essentially carrying even today this is the hangover and uh, so they started having flood control measures whether in koshi or in other parts which essentially aggravated flood damages and there is a number of uh, quite a bit of literature on this so this is where essentially the malthusian creed uh, became dominant the very critical malthusian creed that uh, actually dominates our thinking globally in fact in large parts of the world especially in the developing world is that it is scarcity which induces conflicts or water conflicts so you have to address scarcity now how do you have to address scarcity you have to create more supply of water how do you create more supply of water create more bigger structures create bigger and bigger structures so this is why in fact i'm uh, we are still reliant on this arithmetic hydrologic paradigm and this is how i define this paradigm that it attempts to reduce everything to numerical figures for convenience of decision making but in the process it loses out on very very critical aspects of a flow regime which ranges from the ecosystem to the nuances of the society and livelihoods and this results in bigger conflicts bigger conflicts in the sense conflicts over paradigms conflicts over time and space now some of the examples of arithmetic hydrology in india happens to be of course the fallacy of surplus and deficit river basins the fundamental basis of uh, on uh, the basis of or, uh, I, i mean this created the basis of interlinking of indian rivers as far as nature is concerned there cannot be anything surplus or anything deficit this is an endowment and eventually deserts have survived in the fashion that they are that's the ecosystem and surplus there is nothing called a surplus river basin what is a surplus river basin as far as the uh, recent unpublished document of 1998 of nci wrdp which is written by uh, ad mohile i mean the ganga and the brahmaputra are surplus river basins on what basis because every drop of water has its own ecosystem function and its own ecosystem service and you want to divert the water towards the scarce or the deficit river basins as per your definition that is essentially the kaveri or suppose say uh, the narmada now they also have their own ecosystem so without understanding the sediment regime without understanding the ecosystem processes you simply cannot reduce everything to a number per capita availability in fact way back in the 1980s it was uh, first uh, the entire entire uh, 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 the, the the very mapping in terms of uh, surplus and deficit or they didn't use the term surplus and deficit but they classified river basins in terms of water per capita water availability this was done in fact at the stockholm international water institute and that too with a publication from malin falkenmark and uh, two of her colleagues but eventually in fact after the 1990s and over the uh, 2000 the global water partnership with malin falkenmark and peter rogers they came up with a more succinct definition of integrated water governance which started in fact uh, plugging in the concerns of the ecosystem and eventually that creates an integrated framework out here and even when we are talking about the environment in india uh, suppose the environmental flows we are putting across a particular value to it say this percent of the flow is needed by the environment so in fact this is how the quantity quality and the and the timing of the flow should be maintained so you simply cannot reduce environmental flows to a specific value in fact if one goes to the original literature of iucn flows literature that talks of a negotiated approach and right now in fact uh, um, united states of america uh they ha they have their wild rivers bill uh, at the same time uh, sorry wild rivers act and at the same time there is a large scale thinking on in the context of free flowing rivers so the problem with arithmetic hydrology in india is that water is a stock of resource 
to be stocked and used as per human convenience. And here lies the problem. And here, this has been the root of all kinds of conflicts. Let me just give you two examples in here. One is the Kaveri discourse, which of course has a, a pretty checkered history. Uh, hostile hydropolitical relations uh, uh, initiated between the princely states of Mysore, state of Mysore and the Madras presidency, which after the 1956 reorganization of the states, uh, 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 we have this uh, not so friendly hydropolitical relations between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. And a host of ideas have been floated in this regard, but none of this actually hit upon the economic origins of the conflict or even the ecological uh, dimensions of the conflict. It all became a matter of identity politics eventually and matter of egos. Now let us look at the Kaveri Water Tribunal Award, which is again another example of arithmetic hydrology. The, the Kaveri Water Tribunal Awards that states that the total utilizable waters for the Kaveri on the basis of 50% dependability. Why 50% dependability? No clarification has been provided. 740 TMC. 419 TMC to Tamil Nadu, 270 to Karnataka, 30 TMC to Kerala and whatever, whatever. And the award states, 10 TMC has been reserved for environmental protection, 4 TMC for inevitable escapages to the sea. The basis of 10 TMC and 4 TMC is utterly ad hoc. Who says that 10 TMC is simply going to be essentially good for the environment. Who says that so much is needed? And if you're looking at the human dimension of, 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 the, of, of the need, on what basis did you arrive at 50% uh, dependability? Secondly, why we call lack of integration is this entire allocation mechanism was based solely on surface water without taking into consideration groundwater. Now, interestingly, if you are not taking a, as far as a river basin is concerned, you simply, this is again a problem with uh, in India that we have uh, a separate, uh, separate groundwater board uh, and a central water commission. And therefore the very interactivity of the surface and the groundwater somehow gets lost. There is actually no difference between the two. It is essentially the surface water which flows and moves to the ground and eventually after a point in time, it can move up. So, uh, and uh, very recently in 2016, a very, very important report came up, a 21st century uh, institutional architecture for water. Uh, this, this report was, this, uh, the chairman of this committee was Dr. Mihir Shah. And that report stated that both this body, Central Water Commission and the Central Groundwater Board, both these, com uh, both these bodies uh, should be relinquished. They should be integrated and an integrated National Water Commission should be formed, NWC. So uh, this is how the global integration or suppose uh, the global uh, scientific knowledge has been progressing so far, but we are way away from that. And one of the critical drivers of conflict, which we often miss out as far as the Kaveri waters are concerned, it is also the government's inadvertent incentivization for paddy cultivation. The acreage, in fact, of irrigated paddy doubled in the Karnataka part of the basin between 1981 and 1999. And the movement happened from ragi, finger millet, to paddy. Interestingly, ragi used to be a pretty dominant crop, in fact, in the 50s and the 60s. But even to when, in fact, uh, the Green Revolution came and all the, the, the beneficiaries of Green Revolution turned out to be wheat and paddy, not only that, our entire food security definition, the entire delineation was uh, confined to wheat and paddy. Even if you look at the Food Corporation of India or suppose the delineation of the buffer stock and the buffer norm, uh, it's largely absolutely in the context of wheat and paddy. And that is precisely why throughout from 1977 or 1978 that the minimum support price regime came and the FCI and the state procurement agencies, we didn't have a dual pricing mechanism even for procurement. The state procurement agencies and the FCI, they started procuring paddy at the minimum support price every year so that 
uh, uh, the farmers can be provided incentives to produce paddy and wheat, the MSP of paddy was increased at a much, much faster rate between 1981 and uh, 2003 uh, than, in fact, the drier crops like Jawar, Bajra, and Ragi. Uh, in fact, a very detailed analysis of this has been made in my paper in Water Policy in 2009, how essentially the terms of trade or the minimum support price ratios, which eventually dictated the market prices, actually moved from uh, ragi to paddy, which essentially resulted in a shift in acreage from ragi to paddy, in fact, in, uh, in, in, in the Kaveri Basin, especially in parts of Karnataka. And Tamil Nadu already was, uh, they, they have already been producing uh, extremely water consuming crops. It's, uh, it was paddy and in the Delta, you also find sugarcane. And not only that, there was another force. It's not only the supply side push for uh, producing uh, paddy, but also, in fact, it has been found uh, that the PDS public distribution system throughout the 80s and the 90s has been selling rice at a much lower price than other staple crops, shifting the consumption towards rice, though, in fact, ragi was a dominantly consumed crop in Karnataka. And of course, the real cost of irrigation water was diminishing. This is precisely because the water cases were not revised, in fact, throughout the 80s and the 90s, post-1982. In fact, in Karnataka and post-1965 uh, or 70, in fact, in Tamil Nadu. So all these were the economic drivers of the conflict. And more importantly, both the states had three crops of paddy. Uh, the Kuruvai crop of, uh, uh, the, especially, especially the swine season of the Kuruvai crop, uh, converged with the, the harvesting season of, or, or supposed to the growing season of the summer paddy in Karnataka. And that was one of the times when, in fact, you needed, that was especially the month of June, when you needed water for both. And this coincidence of demand led to conflicts, especially in the month of June, especially if you look at the period of 80s and the 90s. But later on, in fact, it was no more economics, it became more of politics. Uh, and then you have the property rights issues. As I stated, fragmented governance as far as uh, water governance in India is concerned. Water happens to be a state subject. So the states keep on defining the user rights over water in their own ways. And this by itself is problematic. So it's not the river basin, which essentially your unit of governance. The state has its, uh, suppose Karnataka has its own ways of defining property rights. Tamil Nadu has its own ways of defining property rights. Now, as far as the three extreme principles of water allocation are concerned, it's Harmon, History, and Hobbes. The Harmon doctrine states, if water falls on my roof, then it is mine. History means prior appropriation. If I have essentially extracted water uh, long back, or the first appropriator of water, then uh, I develop some kind of a right over the resource. And then you have the Hobbesian doctrine, which is essentially uh, uh, some form of negotiation or negotiated way of arriving at uh, user rights. Now, water in India falls in the state list, sent uh, subject to provisions of 56.1 of the Indian constitution, which allows the center to intervene in some way or the other, but the centers in the case of interstate waters, somehow uh, they have started their responsibilities, they don't want to intervene except for setting up some water tribunals through ISWD, Interstate uh, 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 Water Dispute uh, Act. Now, uh, Nilanjan, uh, uh, may I intervene? Uh, uh, this is just a clarificatory question. Uh, I may be naive in asking this, uh, but when you say uh, sharing of waters, uh, uh, are there any rules and regulations regarding sharing of waters, like the one which you mentioned between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu? Uh, uh, has the tribunal gone into uh, that part? Uh, uh, at the very beginning, I mentioned that this is the amount allocation, 419 TMC for, look at this slide, the second point, 419 TMC or to Tamil Nadu, 270 to Karnataka. 3 TMC to Kerala. This is the location. Yeah, sure. But what's the basis? I mean, uh... that is that that itself is the question. The large uh, what has been the basis is largely the agricultural water use. Because yes. out here, uh, essentially, and also they took into consideration, uh, which what uh, suppose is Tamil Nadu, because large portions of the of, of, of the uh, basin essentially falls in Tamil Nadu. 
So that has also been taken into consideration. So it's, it's purely a quantitative uh, assessment without taking into consideration sediments, without taking into consideration, in fact, the ecosystem water needs, without doing any kind of assessments of the environmental flows. And uh, what it says is environmental protection, where we have a problem. So it's not a holistic basin level view, which has been taken in here, but purely, in fact, an agricultural and an economic view so that at least, you know, uh, you can maintain some kind of a peaceful coexistence of the two states. That is where what it is confined to. So in here, what also happened is that, that it's not only a conflict over the water resource itself, it's also a conflict of definition of property rights. Upstream Karnataka is defining the property rights in terms of Harbon doctrine that water falls on my roof, so this is mine. We might be a late starter of uh, irrigation, but that doesn't mean that doesn't preclude my right over this particular resource. So if it is mine, I have the every right to develop, uh, or suppose to create canal irrigation, create, uh, construct dams or do whatever I like. On the other hand, Tamil Nadu, in fact, they insist that the 1924 agreement, which was between the two states of, uh, I mean, the Madras presidency, and uh, the princely state of Mysore uh, over, the, uh, over the water release from the Krishnaraja Sagara Dam, that should be the basis of the agreement. And not only that, they have been historically using the, this water right from the Chola dynasty. In fact, irrigation development happened and paddy, you find evidences of paddy cultivation in the Kaveri Delta. And uh, so they use this particular uh, principle of prior appropriation or the history, doctrine of history. So you find that water is a state subject. Now, when you're making it a state subject, states are essentially trying to define the rights over the water in their own ways. I'm saying this is Harmon doctrine. He is saying this is uh, history. And we don't have any fundamental basis to argue that, no, it is the Harmon doctrine that the constitution believes in. Constitution that states here that it is the state subject subject to uh, provisions of 56.1 of the Indian Constitution. So it's a, again a conflict of property rights, definition of property rights. So this is one of the examples of uh, pure arithmetic hydrology pre think, thinking prevailing. The other one, of course, is the case of the Farakka and the drying Sundarbans Delta. I have already talked about uh, uh, the Bangladesh's problem with the dry season flows. And in 1996, the Ganges water sharing agreement uh, came into being between Bangladesh and India, especially for the during the dry season. And there was a schedule of flows that had to be maintained and uh, depending on the base flow. And uh, so on alternate days, uh, I mean, uh, there, there has to be a certain amount of water that has to be released from Paraka because it is given in details in the agreement. But the fact remains that this agreement only talks about the liquid flow. And as I stated that there is no mention of how do we manage the sediments, which is turning out to be a major, major problem for uh, managing the sediments upstream as also in fact, uh, the downstream is not receiving the sediments and the, and the delta is dying in the process. So uh, here in fact, in the map, as you can see uh, in, out there, in fact, in the red, you can see the Farakka Barat. And you have the feeder canal, uh, which essentially is feeding the water from the mainstream Ganga to the uh, uh, through the Hagiruti Hugli channel, and uh, eventually that uh, reduces the dry season flow to a large extent. So presently, what you will find is uh, this is something very interesting, and we noted in fact uh, in our recent paper uh, that whatever water is released from the Farakka. Uh, actually, Bangladesh receives more water than that. They have a measuring station at Hardinge Bridge. And that is precisely because uh, this may be because of two factors. One is maybe, in fact, uh, you know, there is uh, some water might be emerging uh, from an aquifer out there in the Bangladesh border. Or else, as you can see in the map, this, there is this Mahananda channel, uh, which though it remains dry in most parts of the year, but this flows, in fact, into Bangladesh and meets the mainstream Ganga 
upstream of the Hardinge Bridge, which also provides some amount of water. So these are two plausible explanations of Bangladesh receiving more water than what is re actually released from Farakka. So uh, now the other critical thing as far as this upstream sedimentation is concerned are the floods in Bihar. Uh, we know of the Koshi floods and uh, there's extensive literature on why essentially, how essentially, uh, you know, a uh, host of embankments in and around the Koshi has aggravated the floods, in fact, uh, in, in Bihar. But at the same time, uh, if you recall, there was a call, in fact, from the Bihar CM around four years back that the Farakka barrage should be removed uh, precisely because of this upstream sedimentation. And the hypothesis that he floated was the, uh, the backwater hypothesis. That now it's, though in fact the Central Water Commission says that the upstream impact of Farakka can only be up to 42 kilometers, but still in fact we feel there is this possibility that at water is coming, especially in fact, uh, in, 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 in a, if there are uh, two high flows converge, especially from the Koshi and the mainstream Ganga and they converge and there is some kind of a major because right now there's so much of sedimentation that the sedi uh, that it's a sediment wall and when the heat upon this wall the especially the two flows there is a possibility of uh, uh, of a backwater splash which and the cascading impacts of sediments can create this upstream floods so uh, bihar cm of course called for this farakka barrage removal which west bengal of course uh, was not didn't agree to this. So this, as you can see in here, that this has created some kind of what in uh, political science they often call, or international relations, they often call a two-level game. A game, in fact, that is being uh, played within the states as also, in fact, a game at the international level between Bangladesh and India. So uh, now, why West Bengal essentially uh, would like to have this uh, barrage and the feeder canal is also because of the fact that because of this diversion through the Hooghly, large parts of non-tidal West Bengal, including Kolkata, has become water secure. And during the dry season. But problems still lie with the non-existence integrated river basin governance approach and consequent institutional structures and studies not a single study exists on how do we essentially manage this entire uh, problem. How do we take an integrated approach with water, with the sediment, with the economy, and the large scale economy dependent on the water and the sediment. So it has, though in fact 1996 agreement as I state in here, the issues get resolved at a geostrategic or a geopolitical level, but or a hydropolitical level to be more specific. It has it is yet to hit the core issues. The more important issue is what is going to happen in 2026 because this agreement between Bangladesh and India, uh, uh, which was signed in 1996, is supposed to have a duration of 30 years. So, uh, and in any case, the utility of the Faraka no Barad, but Faraka was constructed way back in 1975 no dam or barrage or whatever you call it has a lifespan of uh, more than 30 or 40 years. So what is going to happen as far as 2026 is concerned? Are we going to live with the Faraka? Are we going to dismantle the Faraka? So a more detailed integrated assessment needs to be done, keeping in view the impacts of removal as also staying with the Faraka. Uh, so let me just come to the change that is happening, some tenets of this integrated thinking, uh, which in fact uh, uh, we, we actually constructed by collecting from a host <coughs> of literature. The first and foremost thing is that the water should be viewed <coughs> as an integral component of the global hydrological cycle and not as a stock of material resource to be used for uh, satisfaction of human requirements. Supply of ever increasing volumes of water is not a prerequisite for continued economic growth and food security. Rather, we should think about more crop per drop. Water and food are already delinked in the new heterodox economics of water. That's what I am going to talk of. And clear and strict prioritization of the various types of needs and demands for water is needed, including those of the ecosystems. 
there is a need for comprehensive assessment of water development projects, keeping the integrity of the full hydrological cycle. And here, ecological economics has to play a very important role, a pivotal role in the development of a transdisciplinary framework of assessment. There is a need for an interdisciplinary knowledge base, which clear acknowledgement of the interactivity of the social, uh, economic and ecological forces, the basin ecosystem. This is much more critical because what we have is a very fragmented approach. Basin ecosystem is not understood as the unit of governance as far as India is concerned, because uh, water being a state subject to a large extent and the river flows should be understood in association with the sediments and the ecosystems associated. We have to think of appropriate institutional mechanisms like integrated basin governance. And uh, we have to accept a new globally accepted state of art definition of environmental flows, replacing the ways we are following it right now. That is entailing a barely a percentage of the total flow. 10 PMC for environmental protection, that shouldn't be the case. So now uh, let me talk about the new economics of water or what I essentially talked about from arithmetic hydrology to the heterodox economics. Uh, more importantly, this new economics visualizes the human society as a component of the broader ecosystem and, uh, and looks at the holistic interactivities of the human system and the hydrological cycles. So economic instruments like valuation of ecosystem services, their long-term losses due to human interventions, all need to be plugged into the holistic cost benefit metrics along with the criticality of the institutional structures. Therefore, this new holistic economics is one of the critical pivotal disciplines in integrated water governance. So let me uh, show you a case in here uh, where in fact we have put across certain values to the flow regimes through economic valuation. So various flow regimes are associated with various ecosystem services and might entail changes in the target groups who receives these services. So uh, this is essentially the fundamental conceptual framework where you have every flow regime which is providing us with an ecosystem service. You can change the flow regime just as you did in the case of Faraka. It is going to be, there will be a change in the ecosystem services as also the target groups. So now, importantly, valuation of ecosystem services as one of the instruments, it's not that it can resolve all the problems as one of the critical instruments to understand the flow regime becomes extremely important. <coughs> so it also helps us in, in prioritizing the projects and also understanding the trade-offs. So this was essentially implemented, in fact, in, in the upper Ganges and uh, uh, on how essentially the, uh, what kind of flow regime should be followed in the Narora barrage and whether an environmental flows regime can be implemented as was uh, in terms of the figures given by uh, some of the experts. So I'm not going to get into the methodology right now. So let me just show you that, uh, the business as usual flow regime and the e flows regime. During the Southwest monsoon, the e flows regimes are pretty well maintained. The problem arises during the dry season, especially, in fact, from the e flows regime, there is a deficit of 18.5% during the month of December and 17.6% during the month of April. This is downstream of Narora. So, what we did was we put across a value, a monetary value, uh, by using uh, uh, various methods, including the production function method and other uh, 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 other market. Uh, 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 mostly, in fact, the river preference approaches have been taken, benefit transfers, as also, in fact, uh, in some cases, uh, 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 travel costs. So, uh, water in agriculture, in water in agriculture, we use the production function uh, by taking in, into consideration a panel. Uh, Nilanjan, this business as usual, uh, use some methodology? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm not going to get into this right now because it's just a case. I will, will be happy to share the paper because this is from a separate paper altogether. So, okay. just as water in agriculture, you can see in this slide, we use the production function method to get to this value. Religious tourism. Uh, this we didn't take into consideration the uh, because it's some economists are also in here so I can talk about this we didn't take into consideration the consumer surplus in here because of the existence of income effects 
uh, carbon sequestration, uh, we essentially took into consideration <coughs> the, uh, the, uh, the VER prices. Then, of course, market microclimate regulation benefit transfer methods were used. For water purification, we again used benefit transfer method. For forest tourism, travel costs method have been used. And uh, riverbed farming, we essentially use the coefficient that we obtained from uh, water in agriculture. So what we found is that the business uh, as usual method uh, 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 valuation yielded us, or this particular existing flow regime is already yielding us in that particular strait, just in the downstream of Narora, is yielding us a value of 874 billion INR uh, annually. That is the value, in fact, for the year 2015-16. And as, in fact, we changed, we had two types, if we have two types of interventions in terms of scenarios, that is water use efficiency and yield enhancement and crop diversification case, we thought of two institutional interventions, if this can be done, then what happens? We were looking at three target variables. First of all, the value of the flow regime. Uh, the, we knew that if demand management has to be done because 90% of the consumption of water has been happening in the agricultural sector. And if demand management has to be done, then what if we think of water use efficiency in agriculture and in enhancement through better soil uh, management practices and crop diversification, especially from wheat to sorghum. Uh, so we took into consideration various scenarios uh, we, so A, B, C, D were various water use efficiency in yield enhancement scenario. And then in fact, crop diversification scenarios, E to K, E is 1% decline in the area of wheat, 2% decline in area of wheat taken by sorghum, 5%. Uh, so it's because sorghum consumes less water than that of wheat. And so more water can be left in stream. So eventually what we found is that the ecosystem services, what is the impact on the ecosystem services? Is there a gain to the farmer? Is there more water released in stream? And with that increased in stream release, whether the environmental flows can be attained or not. So what we find is that the best scenario emerges as scenario B that reveals the highest value of the flow regime because of the highest uh, uh, value of the ecosystem services, the highest value for the farmer as also meeting the environmental flows requirements. And of course, we also have of the crop diversification scenario, scenario F, which entails 2% decline in area of wheat, which is taken up by sorghum. So if we combine these two, we find that the flow regime, the value of the flow regime is maximum. As also, in fact, the farmer also gains in the process. It's not that the farmer loses out. So there is inefficient water use that has been happening. So this is just an example of a framework uh, by way of which we, when we started uh, thinking about, we are not talking about more water for agriculture because it's a water scarce region, rather less water for agriculture. So this is what we have. So importantly, these are the kind of instruments that need to be used. And a large body of literature is also emerging, uh, which is acknowledged in the domain of ecological economics, which is trying to understand the working of institutions that can help in management of water or governance of water, keeping in view its integration in the broader socio-eco-hydrological cycle. So importantly, these types of uh, heterodox economics frameworks accept the complementarity of the two approaches, valuation and institutions. Valuations affect developments of institutions, rather they often justify institutions. And it is again the institutions which determine these values. So if you look at uh, this particular framework, in fact, uh, where we are looking at this integration across the river basin scale, we are... <coughs> Uh, talking of a host of parameters across space and time, taking into consideration the various ecological parameters, biosphere, the biomes, the landscapes, the ecosystems, communities and organisms, the hydrological parameters, including the aquifers. If you have to understand the basin, you have to understand the aquifers, watershed, water bodies, uh, the various uh, the socioeconomic parameters, and of course, the critical and in other institutional parameters in the context of 
uh, regulations, uh, river basin organizations. Now here comes the role of an RBO or a river basin organization, which has to be multidisciplinary in nature and which has to think about this integrated river basin governance. And when we are talking of integrated river basin governance, there are three critical pillars that we have to take into consideration. The economic pillar, the social pillar, and the environmental pillar. And in here, I'd just like to bring in, in fact, uh, uh, Mohan Muna Singhe's uh, 1990s framework of sustainomics, uh, where he presented the sustainomic framework, in fact, as an irreconcilable trinity of efficiency, equity, and sustainability. And that is the challenge at the river basin scale. And for that, if you have to integrate them, you need to have the right kind of institutional framework, which is looking at the economic, social, and the environmental objectives in an integrated framework. And here, essentially, ecological economics has to play an important role. You have to have an enabling environment as far as the institutional framework is concerned. You have to have community participation, long-term basin planning, interdisciplinary knowledge base, integrated policy and decision making considering various scales, investments by uh, government, civil society. You need to have the monitoring system. And not only the monitoring system, you need to also have the feedback loop, which can state whether the institution is working properly or not. And valuation uh, of, of, of your projects can essentially emerge as an important feedback loop out here. So, but in order to have such an institutional and a governance mechanism uh, to drive such an integrated approach, there are still very, very critical knowledge gaps that are prevalent as far as Indian water governance is concerned. Uh, of course, the institutional void is there. There is a clear lack of acknowledgement of the need to consider river basin as the unit of governance. And in the statutes, which has essentially, I, I use this, often use this term, conflictual federalism. It's essentially the federal structure in India, which is leading to interstate water conflicts and not federal structure in the sense, treating water uh, as part of the state list. Then there, there are extensive knowledge gaps as far as the ecohydrological knowledge on the surface water systems are concerned. There are knowledge gaps as far as flood management is concerned. Even uh, we don't understand the mechanism of cloud bursts and flush floods. It's yet to be understood meteorologically. Uh, the knowledge in, of social dimensions of water systems and local governance, that is a very, very critical knowledge gap. Now, over time, the, the demand drivers are changing over space and time. This needs to be understood. How do we understand the very, very critical environment. How, how do we assess environmental flows, first of all? What are the various, who are the various stakeholders of water? Is it, should water or suppose say a river have human rights? I mean, in New Zealand, they passed the statutes. In Uttarakhand, uh, they stated that rivers have life. Now, how do we understand this particular dynamics? There are knowledge gaps. The most critical knowledge gap actually uh, emerges in the form of our Himalayan components. The mechanism of the generation and draining out of floodwaters in the Himalayan foothills and floodplains is yet to be understood. The dynamics of the generation, transportation, and the deposition of sediments all along the course of Himalayan rivers is yet to be understood. Seismic risks and how, if we at all have a structure well, I'm just putting it across as fine. This structure can withstand earthquake up to maybe 6.8 or 7.2 or 7.5 Richter scale. What is the possibility that uh, there won't be anything be a, I mean, there won't anything more powerful than that, an earthquake more powerful than that? What are the impacts of structural interventions on the Himalayan rivers, like dams, barrages, on, and embankments? Precisely because we don't understand the Himalayan ecosystem as such, how do we understand the structure and the processes? and the services that they are providing. And eventually the impact of these four on the economic feasibility of water development projects. The, the worst part of the story is that large part of data on transboundary waters are classified. They are not in public domain. So objective uh, scientific analysis simply gets impeded in the process. 
In fact, right now I just put across a contention that uh, well, there is this possibility that sedimentation might be causing upstream sedimentation might be causing uh, the backwater effect and floods. In fact, further upstream of Bihar, Nitish Kumar might be correct, but there is no data to prove it. It's all conjecture, and uh, Central Water Commission just gives a verdict. No, it's up to 42 kilometers upstream that it can have an impact, and. There is no independent way or independent assessment to check the veracity of this claim by Central Water Commission. And more importantly, the threat point of global warming and climate change. Where are we going from here? Are the monsoons going to shift? If the, there is a shift in monsoon, are we going to have water wars on the Kaveri? It's precisely because when the monsoon gets delayed and there is coincidence of demand, uh, between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu for paddy cultivation that we are having uh, an escalated conflict. But if the monsoons keep on shifting, can our system adapt to such changing processes? So these are some of the critical knowledge gaps that still exist. So uh, while I uh, conclude, all I'd like to say is that a paradigm shift is needed from the reductionist arithmetic hydrology to holistic integrated thinking uh, with heterodox economics is, is going to be a critical pillar. And this, the role of economics has also been acknowledged as a critical pillar in the Mahesha Committee report on a 21st century institutional architecture for India's water reforms. Governance structures, processes, and institutions need to imbibe such interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary thinking. We cannot remain confined to monodisciplinary reductionism, which has led us to so many problems. We have to understand the trade-offs. We have to understand the flow regimes as the flow of water sediments and the ecosystem processes, the social processes and the institutions associated. So with that, I'd like to thank you and thank you, Shumesh, for yeah, inviting yeah. me for this lecture. Brilliant, uh, Nilanjan. Thank you so, so much for this informative and enlightening talk, uh, ranging from host of issues, right from IPR to water share, sharing to, to spatial, when a river flows to these three countries and, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, the spatial concerns and uh, you know the the crucial role of uh, these uh, multilateral institutions uh, because uh, in in such cases you require interventions and then of course your holistic approach uh, where you had all these three pillars uh, from economic social and environmental uh, pillars and also uh, the interesting part was uh, some bit of uh, methodology uh, behind these, uh, these figures that you had put across and uh, the water sharing issues. So, uh, you know, these are very critical issues. And uh, I believe as I was talking right at the beginning, countries like uh, South Africa uh, managed it through uh, demand management, uh, especially uh, uh, the intervention of the society. While Israel had a different approach, they had more of technology coming in, uh, uh, but uh, not going that far in India, for example, in the 90s, I could, I could see that places like Chennai had huge uh, water issues, uh, but still uh, we were able to tide over that part, even in MP, we had issues uh, of water scarcity and, and then of course, uh, water sharing issues. So you have covered uh, various uh, dimensions uh, of uh, this uh, uh, problem uh, or governance issues. Uh, uh, so I'll come back to you, but let me open it to the uh, to the August house, to the floor. If there are any questions, queries, uh, observations to be made, uh, you're free to make it. 
Yeah, the floor is open now. So Dr. Ghosh, uh, it was a brilliant uh, lecture and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I, I wish to uh, speak to the point of your, to your point of uh, raising uh, uh, thirsty crops like rice uh, rather, than, uh, rather than say uh, the millets, for example. And I was wondering, uh, like, I, this is just a question and uh, reflects my ignorance uh, about how water intensive certain crops are. Uh, is there, uh, is it possible to say, for example, grow pulses like lentils, masoor and all of these uh, instead of rice in some of these regions? And uh, is, there, is there a case for say changing the uh, procurement policies to get some, to procure some of these masoor, which kind of also takes care of say the protein imbalance in the uh, intake, in, in nutrient intake that say our huge vegetarian population in India uh, has. So that's my question. This is a very, very important question. Very important question in the sense that uh, a year back when uh, uh, I was having this conversation with uh, as while uh, Secretary of Ministry of Water Resources, Shashi Shekhar, he mentioned something very interesting to me. He mentioned that it's not only a question of uh, having, you know, you're talking about economy, ecosystem, society. It's also a concern of human health, suppose to the food system. So the now importantly, let us try to understand why, why essentially what is this mechanism of minimum support price? Now, as I mentioned out here, that it's the minimum support price mechanism which has been promoting these particular crops. And if you look at uh, actually track the terms of trade, you will find that it is, though in fact much less trade is happening in the minimum support price as compared to the total volume of trade in these crops, but it is the minimum support price which essentially guides the, or dictates the price mechanism or the terms of trade. Uh, Minimum support price is essentially like a, the financial instrument put option. Being a, an economist, we all understand that. That means if the price falls below the minimum support price under the conditions of perfect information, the farmer or suppose say the aggregator, whosoever he or she is, can actually sell this crop to the uh, Food Corporation of India at the minimum support price. So it also helps in risk management. Now, the idea was that if this entire, uh, you know, terms of trade, which is affecting the area or the acreage can be reversed or not. In 2018, the CSCP, Commission on Agricultural Costs and Prices, they raised the price of ragi. They possibly understood that they have to promote the drier crops they raised the price of ragi by 55%, but the price of rice by barely 9%. This is 2018 rabi. Now rabi happens to be a completely irrigated crop. So high water demand during that time. Ha had it been a, a, a monsoon crop, it doesn't matter really. Now it's not that the acreage is going to be uh, to respond to that instantaneously. As we know, in fact, this is our fundamental assumption, neo very neoclassical assumption, but it works to a large extent. That is the cobweb theorem in agriculture and we usually take into consideration the three year cycle. So maybe in fact, by 2021 or 2022, you might find that some responses are coming in the form of the acreage changes. But on the other hand, I agree with you, rather this is something that I have always contended that possibly we should think about the pulses. Pulses need to be promoted from the perspective of food security. A, uh, B, from the perspective of uh, nutrition. So these are two very critical points, but at the same time, price signal is one of the signals. We also need a broader institutional mechanism working with this. It's not only a price, it, there also have to be, see uh, it, the change also happened because of a host of, uh, I would say, input impetus, I'm not using the term input subsidy, 
Green Revolution, of course, had its input subsidy. Apart from that, there was an input impetus. So this input impetus also has to work there in the context of these crops. So uh, once that happens, this can be a holistic movement towards better land management and better food security policy. So on that point, I definitely agree with you. Thank you. Any, anyone else, please? I believe Nilanjan uh, UN uh, SDGs, uh, the uh, goal six also talks about uh, clean and clean drinking water and equitable access, especially, you know, uh, uh, if you talk about Bangladesh, you know, uh, they raise a lot of concern that the water which flows from India, they're not able to get the clean, cleaner water. Uh, so these uh, cross-country conflicts, uh, I was wondering that which is the most appropriate body which uh, needs to intervene to look into uh, uh, these set of issues. Should it be a multilateral investment uh, uh, body uh, 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 or a multilateral discipline or uh, something like uh, uh, a unilateral, you know, move or harmonization or uh, so uh, that uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, is something which uh, uh, needs to be discussed. Uh, uh, but coming back to this MSP issue, especially Punjab and Haryana, uh, uh, wherein uh, we have over the years provided so much of subsidies to at least rice, wheat and sugar. Uh, so apart from pollution and other issues, the water levels in, in these two, two states have also gone down. So is the time have come to move away from these crops to the uh, so to some other crops or, or we need to change our policy regarding agriculture and use it like a transformational tool to uh, uh, you know uh, maybe uh, you know uh, to to use it like providing alternative energy uses using biotechnology and things like that. So is, is that also related to the holistic approach that you're talking about? Yes, of course, of course. In fact, uh, the, by, by the holistic, even, even the first question that you raised is very, very critical. So let me come to both of them uh, sequentially. Uh, first is, uh, related to your concern on uh, transboundary pollution. See, it's not, uh, if, if you look at the Ganga, what essentially made a Gang the Ganges an international transboundary river as far as Bangladesh and India is concerned? It's essentially the partition of India. And if you recall, uh, prior to, uh, I mean, this entire belt was also the belt where jute industry developed. Uh, way back, in fact, jute industry was so very developed that you also had to have a, a, a rather a derivative market in jute, in fact, in the Kolkata Jute and Hessian Exchange, which was set up in 1919, so that trading can happen and risk management can happen here. And not only that, you also have this uh, belt of uh, iron and steel factories, this, the large uh, MSME sectors, in fact, clusters, MSME clusters in this part. And it's not that they developed right now, in fact, uh, in Kolkata, Howrah and other parts, but also, in fact, in the along the shores of the Ganga, not only in the shores, shores of the Hooghly. So uh, they were there, in fact, right from uh, India to Bangladesh. So this pollution uh, doesn't owe its origin to uh, something to India as such, but it's 
it's it's essentially historically this was there and now over time of course it's getting more and more polluted there was this allegation at one point in time why essentially the hilsha or the ilish march that uh, one of the delicacies of bengalis why is that declining in the ganges and also in the padma padma in the sense though ganges uh, the padma happens to be a, a stretch of the ganges which is from uh, from the goalondo uh, goalondo ghat to chatpur so as uh, in, in in bangladesh so uh, what is happening is that there is excessive pollution and also stream flow depletion which leads to the fish the uh, hilsha happens to be a marine fish which essentially swims into the fresh water so they were uh, there, there was a problem in fact because of pollution and most of the the best of the school of fish they were moving in fact towards myanmar and that led to a large scale decline in fish catch over the last 15 years now transboundary pollution is an issue precisely because of uh, industry on the one hand and and it is not that india only needs to be blamed bangladesh also has its own share of pollution so uh, that, that that keeps on happening now when you are talking about who is going to govern this this is a very very critical question now who governs this because uh, india is not a signatory to the 1997 Uh, agreement which is on non navigational water use united nations convention on non navigational water use india is not a signatory so they don't have to conform or they don't conform to most of these uh, uh, conventions or legal statutes related to that uh bangladesh happens to be a downstream so it wants that all these legal statutes and conventions uh, i mean all all these statutes are conformed with so th- there is this kind of a conflict as well but uh, on the other hand if you talk about an rbo a river basin organization which can take an integrated view of the basin itself then in fact it becomes a different then india also has to agree bangladesh also has to agree just as something that you have over the rhine an institutional structure that you have over the rhine or the danube and they essentially one of the critical elements they they don't have problems with the flow mind it they have problems with pollution and these are these are transboundary international river basin organizations they have their ultimate say they are formed of representatives from these various nations various uh, riparian nations they have their institutional structures it's a very multidisciplinary group of engineers hydrologists uh, uh, seismic scientists uh, uh, different uh, uh, the biologists the ecological scientists then the economists sociologists Uh, basin modelers so uh, and eventually they come up with uh, their own recommendations on how essentially the water should be used so even in within india if you at all have to have just as we uh, right now have set up something like the kaveri water management authority which is again infested with engineers only as if this is an engineering problem and nothing else so uh, the kaveri water management authority again has turned out to be pretty monodisciplinary but at the same time the problem is that this is not an autonomous body it has to be an autonomous body which has to have sufficient powers to penalize the states and which is not going to be subservient to the ministry that will be a problem because then suppose say you have a, a congenial ministry um, uh, suppose say you have the bjp government in state x and the congress government in state y and the center has some other government which is either uh, might have a favorable relation so then it turns out to be a problem so create an autonomous independent river basin authority which is going to have an al- the ultimate say on water use and water governance that is the way to proceed this also answers your second question that how do we go about the punjab haryana case there is a need to in fact to in fact dictate or educate the farmers in the case of uh, the uh, changing in the cropping cr- cropping patterns and uh, ch- changing the crops as such you simply cannot have the rice wheat cycle because out there the problem is also with groundwater the groundwater levels have declined to uh, above minimal levels i mean uh, they are almost at their nadir you simply cannot keep on exploiting them any further 
So who is going to dictate on that? This turns out to be a critical problem. That is why I am stating that an integrated approach where you consider basin as the unit of governance, surface water is not only the water that you are, you are supposed to govern, it's also the groundwater, the basin. Groundwater is part of the river basin ecosystem. It resuscitates the surface flow. Again, the surface flow can go down and resuscitate the groundwater aquifers. And one needs to understand this dynamics, one needs to understand the fundamental economics associated with it. And that has to provide, a, that should be a pivotal discipline for creating this integrated approach. I see two hope in India. One is this inland waterways, like they're connecting Delhi to Haldia in uh, West Bengal through Allahabad and Banaras, wherein a lot of business activities can go through. I don't know what's your, uh, because you talked about spatial development. So I was thinking in that context. And second, of course, is this age old tragedy of commons because uh, mm. say we have uh, 3,800 coastal uh, kilometers of coastal area. Now they're saying that, uh, you know, you can use these large ships to move out for deep fishing, say beyond seven to eight nautical miles to 100 nautical miles. So this brings to that age old problem of uh, tragedy of commons. Once uh, you know that uh, sharing has, uh, you know, uh, every, everything has to be shared. So you then uh, move along and, 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 and do the, the, the business. So th that, but, but on the other hand, uh, you have all these technology coming in, in, in the shipping uh, uh, business wherein, uh, which allows you to move beyond uh, these borders, more, more, about 100 nautical miles and so on. So this blue economy is uh, becoming so much of important to uh, you know um, to uh, to to all of us and probably that is something that we can look upon uh, in future absolutely absolutely and for the blue economy to sustain essentially you need these this this entire flow to happen this inland flow to be there you have to have the other part so uh, this is extremely critical because the hinterland of the blue economy the supporting service of the blue economy is being provided by essentially the inland waterways, the inland waters itself. Now, as far as the inland waterways are concerned, of course, that is a, a very good idea in terms of uh, from, from, from various perspectives. The problem is that this cannot be a perennial source of transport, more so because of the changing draft. During the dry season, especially uh, your heavy duty vehicles, heavy duty vehicles won't be in a position essentially to navigate. So heavy duty cargo will be an issue. And, uh, and even even uh, I'm, I'm talking of the Haldia port in this part. And uh, so the connectivity that one has been thinking of from NW1 to NW2, that won't be there in any case. Uh, especially during the dry seasons. So uh, this is, a, I mean, when the uh, sun is shining, uh, I mean, it's fine. You can, it's, it's okay. You are during the monsoon or post monsoon period, these are going to be pretty fine. Yeah, but that also brings us to another question, like, should we, given that we have alternative modes of road and rail transportation today, should we think of our waterways or, or our rivers as modes of transportation, or should we adopt a more ecological aspect, like, should we think of uh, these as providing uh, as a recharging aquifer, providing sustenance for um, agriculture, like sustaining the ecosystem. And uh, I was curious, like, uh, what what is so, your opinion? See, this is non-consumptive use. First of all, mm -hmm. you have to understand that navigation is non-consumptive use. Mm -hmm. Just as suppose a hydropower, so-called hydropower ideal is non-consumptive use. It's, it's not that it is supposed to consume water. 
so there is uh, no way that uh, and this is perfectly non consumptive but the fact remains that during that time the draft is so low that the navigability won't be proper you won't have the connectivity that is the issue i see I so see. as far as the ecological dimension is concerned in terms of soft the recharge of aquifers that is going to happen that is not going to be okay. hampered by this the problem with hydropower is separate out here though we mm -hmm. claim that uh, they are non consumptive they are run of the river they are hardly run of the river at times especially during dry season uh, you create a pondage you are storing water for 22 hours for running the turbine for 2 hours and that completely uh, you know dissects the river the total river connectivity gets lost especially if you go towards the tista and uh, to certain parts even even in fact in uh, over the ganga i mean uh, connectivity is lost precisely because of this hydropower projects so it's not that the uh, the water is flowing and the turbine is running that makes it non consumptive once you store the water for 20 hours especially during dry season and then you run the turbine for 4 hours and in those 4 hours suppose it goes to the uh, go, the water goes downstream and then again it finds within 5 kilometers another hydropower project which has been happening in fact over the tista in sikkim you actually kill the river i see so i believe uh, there are if there are no other questions uh, uh, let me thank, uh, thank uh, dr nilanjan for his uh, 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 for taking a time off of his busy, busy schedule and speaking to us here uh, i took the liberty let me share it to uh, record your ah, please uh, please to share it with me so that your, i can also your share talk it and uh, uh, i am uh, uh, because uh, this was uh, so much uh, informative and enlightening to us here at uh, iit kanpur i was expecting a little bit more people so i was constantly glued to people joining but i believe uh, maybe uh, there are so many other conferences also going at the same time maybe that's the reason so uh, so uh, please do share your uh, mailing address and then uh, we we'll, uh, we'll build on that and uh, uh, thank you so much again uh, thank you thanks for inviting me and uh, please share with me the link so that i can also share the talk in yeah, social media i will i will yeah. let me uh, uh, once we finish and then i will put it in the cloud computing board and then we'll take it from there Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, thanks, please thanks do so share much. your mailing address at some time, please. Uh, okay. Thank you all. Thank you. All the thank attendees you. and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank Dr. Ghosh. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thakur. It was Good a very you. thank you, Professor Nilan. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Oh, bye.